Welcome to the book reading program of 3AB in Australia Radio. The book, The Great Controversy, written by Alan White, deals with the history of the Christian church, starting with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD and continues right through to our day. It also outlines the closing scenes of this earth's history and the principles that are at stake. What you're about to hear is a dramatized audio version of this book created by Nancy Hamilton Myers. To download your free copy, visit thedesireofagesproject.com. Let's listen now as Nancy continues reading from The Great Controversy. The Great Controversy, Chapter 30. Enmity between man and Satan. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The divine sentence pronounced against Satan after the fall of man was also a prophecy, embracing all the ages to the close of time and foreshadowing the great conflict to engage all the races of men who should live upon the earth. God declares, I will put enmity. This enmity is not naturally entertained. When man transgressed the divine law, his nature became evil, and he was in harmony and not at variance with Satan. There exists naturally no enmity between sinful man and the originator of sin. Both became evil through apostasy. The apostate is never at rest, except as he obtains sympathy and support by inducing others to follow his example. For this reason, fallen angels and wicked men unite in desperate companionship. Had not God especially interposed, Satan and man would have entered into an alliance against heaven. And instead of cherishing enmity against Satan, the whole human family would have been united in opposition to God. Satan tempted man to sin, as he had caused angels to rebel, that he might thus secure cooperation in his warfare against heaven. There was no dissension between himself and the fallen angels as regards their hatred of Christ, while on all other points there was discord. They were firmly united in opposing the authority of the ruler of the universe. But when Satan heard the declaration that enmity should exist between himself and the woman, and between his seed and her seed, he knew that his efforts to deprave human nature would be interrupted, that by some means man was to be enabled to resist his power. Satan's enmity against the human race is kindled because through Christ they are objects of God's love and mercy. He desires to thwart the divine plan for man's redemption to cast dishonor upon God by defacing and defiling his handiwork. He would cause grief in heaven and fill the earth with woe and desolation. And he points to all this evil as the result of God's work in creating man. It is the grace that Christ imparts in the soul which creates in man enmity against Satan. Without this converting grace and renewing power, man would continue the captive of Satan, a servant ever ready to do his bidding. But the new principle in the soul creates conflict where hitherto there had been peace. The power which Christ imparts enables man to resist the tyrant and usurper. Whoever is seen to abhor sin instead of loving it, Whoever resists and conquers those passions that have held sway within displays the operation of a principle wholly from above. The antagonism that exists between the spirit of Christ and the spirit of Satan was most strikingly displayed in the world's reception of Jesus. It was not so much because he appeared without worldly wealth, pomp, or grandeur that the Jews were led to reject him. They saw that he possessed power which would more than compensate for the lack of these outward advantages. But the purity and holiness of Christ 
called forth against him the hatred of the ungodly. His life of self-denial and sinless devotion was a perpetual reproof to a proud, sensual people. It was this that evoked enmity against the Son of God. Satan and evil angels joined with evil men. All the energies of apostasy conspired against the champion of truth. The same enmity is manifested toward Christ's followers as was manifested toward their master. Whoever sees the repulsive character of sin and in strength from above resists temptation will assuredly arouse the wrath of Satan and his subjects. Hatred of the pure principles of truth and reproach and persecution of its advocates will exist as long as sin and sinners remain. The followers of Christ and the servants of Satan cannot harmonize. The offense of the cross has not ceased. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Satan's agents are constantly working under his direction to establish his authority and build up his kingdom in opposition to the government of God. To this end, they seek to deceive Christ's followers and allure them from their allegiance. Like their leader, they misconstrue and pervert the scriptures to accomplish their object. As Satan endeavored to cast reproach upon God, so do his agents seek to malign God's people. The spirit which put Christ to death moves the wicked to destroy his followers. All this is foreshadowed in that first prophecy. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. And this will continue to the close of time. Satan summons all his forces and throws his whole power into the combat. Why is it that he meets with no greater resistance? Why are the soldiers of Christ so sleepy and indifferent? Because they have so little real connection with Christ. Because they are so destitute of his spirit. Sin is not to them repulsive and abhorrent as it was to their master. They do not meet it as did Christ with decisive and determined resistance. They do not realize the exceeding evil and malignity of sin, and they are blinded both to the character and the power of the Prince of Darkness. There is little enmity against Satan in his works, because there is so great ignorance concerning his power and malice and the vast extent of his warfare against Christ and his church. Multitudes are deluded here. They do not know that their enemy is a mighty general who controls the minds of evil angels and that with well-matured plans and skillful movements, he is warring against Christ to prevent the salvation of souls. Among professed Christians and even among ministers of the gospel, there is heard scarcely a reference to Satan except perhaps an incidental mention in the pulpit. They overlook the evidences of his continual activity and success. They neglect the many warnings of his subtlety. They seem to ignore his very existence. While men are ignorant of his devices, this vigilant foe is upon their track every moment. He is intruding his presence in every department of the household, in every street of our cities, in the churches, in the national councils, in the courts of justice, perplexing, deceiving, seducing, everywhere ruining the souls and bodies of men, women and children. Breaking up families, sowing hatred, emulation, strife, sedition, murder, and the Christian world seemed to regard these things as though God had appointed them and they must exist. Satan is continually seeking to overcome the people of God by breaking down the barriers which separate them from the world. 
ancient Israel were enticed into sin when they ventured into forbidden association with the heathen. In a similar manner, our modern Israel led astray. The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. All who are not decided followers of Christ are servants of Satan. In the unregenerate heart there is love of sin and a disposition to cherish and excuse it. In the renewed heart there is hatred of sin and a determined resistance against it. When Christians choose the society of the ungodly and unbelieving, they expose themselves to temptation. Satan conceals himself from view and stealthily draws his deceptive covering over their eyes. They cannot see that such company is calculated to do them harm. And while all the time is simulating to the world in character, words and actions, they are becoming more and more blinded. Conformity to worldly customs converts the church to the world. It never converts the world to Christ. Familiarity with sin will inevitably cause it to appear less repulsive. He who chooses to associate with the servants of Satan will soon cease to fear their master. When in the way of duty we are brought into trial, as was Daniel in the king's court, we may be sure that God will protect us but if we place ourselves under temptation, we shall fall sooner or later. The tempter often works most successfully through those who are least suspected of being under his control. The possessors of talent and education are admired and honored as if these qualities could atone for the absence of the fear of God or entitle men to his favor. Talent and culture, considered in themselves, are gifts of God. But when these are made to supply the place of piety, when, instead of bringing the soul nearer to God, they lead away from Him, then they become a curse and a snare. The opinion prevails with many that all which appears like courtesy or refinement must in some sense pertain to Christ. Never was there a greater mistake. These qualities should grace the character of every Christian, for they would exert a powerful influence in favor of true religion, but they must be consecrated to God, or they are a power for evil. Many a man of cultured intellect and pleasant manners, who would not stoop to what is commonly regarded as an immoral act, is but a polished instrument in the hands of Satan. The insidious, deceptive character of his influence and example renders him a more dangerous enemy to the cause of Christ than are those who are ignorant and uncultured. By earnest prayer and dependence upon God, Solomon obtained the wisdom which excited the wonder and admiration of the world. But when he turned from the source of his strength and went forward relying upon himself, he fell a prey to temptation. Then the marvelous powers bestowed on this wisest of kings only rendered him a more effective agent of the adversary of souls. While Satan is constantly seeking to blind their minds to the fact, let Christians never forget that they wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against wicked spirits in high places. The inspired warning is sounding down the centuries to our time. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. From the days of Adam to our own time, our great enemy has been exercising his power to oppress and destroy. 
he is now preparing for his last campaign against the church. All who seek to follow Jesus will be brought into conflict with this relentless foe. The more nearly the Christian imitates the divine pattern, the more surely will he make himself a mark for the attacks of Satan. All who are actively engaged in the cause of God, seeking to unveil the deceptions of the evil one and to present Christ before the people, will be able to join in the testimony of Paul in which he speaks of serving the Lord with all humility of mind, with many tears and temptations. Satan assailed Christ with his fiercest and most subtle temptations, but he was repulsed in every conflict. Those battles were fought in our behalf. Those victories make it possible for us to conquer. Christ will give strength to all who seek it. No man without his own consent can be overcome by Satan. The tempter has no power to control the will or to force the soul to sin. He may distress, but he cannot contaminate. He can cause agony, but not defilement. The fact that Christ has conquered should inspire his followers with courage to fight manfully the battle against sin and Satan.